Well, 2020 was the year of disruption when we talk of COVID-19, when we talk of disruptions across industries, across the globe, uh, whether it was uh, the pharmaceutical industry or any other. Um, there were disruptions as far as supply chain is concerned, manufacturing is concerned. However, it was also a year when the industry came up uh, with newer solutions, it accelerated research, it uh, shortened timelines for newer products to come to the market and also managed its way around the supply chain hurdles uh, so as to uh, you know, be better prepared for any next disruptions. Now to understand how certain companies managed it um, at their end and to look at uh, the digital transformation of the industry. Today, um, I have with me Mr. Sushil Suri, Chairman and MD of Morpen Labs and Bilip Sauni, MD at Rockwell Automation. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here for this special panel discussion. Let me come to you, Mr. Suri, first. You know, 2020 was certainly a year that, uh, you know, no one will ever forget, especially, uh, you know, if you were in the pharmaceutical industry with the kind of disruptions that we saw uh, across supply chain, across manufacturing. You know, your company also launched a range of essential products uh, to, uh, you know, stop the spread of COVID-19. You worked on non-contact infrared thermometers, uh, among other products that you brought to the market. Uh, what kind of disruptions did you see in the manufacturing uh, side of your business um, production? And how did the company manage to get uh, over the disruptions and what were the solutions that you deployed? Thank you, Ashna. I think you very well defined 2020 was a challenge, but I would say every challenge has got an opportunity. So that was the starting point of, of 2020, almost I think in the beginning only in January, February, when it started all in China, Wuhan, we had a lot of import from China. So we, we were basically tracking on a daily basis what's happening there. So we were clear that okay, something is going to happen here also. And we were mentally or internally preparing ourselves that someday if lockdown comes in India, because lockdown was happening in China every next day. Hmm. So we prepared our internal team that in case there is a lockdown, the first thing was work from home. I mean, we, yeah. we started in March, but we were hmm. physically preparing for it in, from February onward. So hmm. I think on the 10th March, when the flight restriction started on 20th March, the whole full uh, Janta curfew was there. So be between that, I think we from 15th, 16th March only, we started shifting guys back home and mm. started getting their computer home and online banking, whatever, whatever was required. So mm. I think that the first phase physically moved people out of office, but that was only the first step. Second was how do we connect to them? How do we reach them? How do we monitor them? And the banking was, uh, was a big issue. We had physical banking, shifting to online banking, signatures, approvals. And, and of course, the IT was not prepared with so much of security controls and the data management. So overnight, uh, people were, I would say, very aggressive. We were able to place people. And we never thought a typical old-style pharma manufacturing company would be working from home. So I would say that was a good start. And that's a, I would say, the enterprise of India, and that's the enterprise of digital readiness we had. Even during the uh, full curfew, full lockdown, we had got curfew passes. Our uh, shipments from custom departments was released. Those were going to the factories. Factory was working, except for one day on that Janta curfew. Mm -hmm. One of the days, we were working the whole of the lockdown period. And we are proud to say the team had done an unbelievable job and amazing, I would say, synergy among the team. Even the r and guys sitting in their work, sitting in their hometowns or sitting in their in their homes, they have been conducting experiments which are being done in the plant. QC guys are doing testing and uh, uh, testing at the labs and uh, the bosses are sitting in the offices or they're sitting in the homes and everything was managed very well. But uh, all I would say thanks to technology, thanks to the Zoom calls, thanks to Microsoft Teams, Cisco, everybody has learned everything. And uh, no surprises, now half of the travel has been cut already, except for the medical representative visiting the doctors. That's the bare minimum. Doctor still expects that. So other than that, I would say 60 to 70 percent of the travel has gone. And it has, I would say, maybe it has gone permanently. We have a big uh, portion of business into diagnostic devices. So yeah. this is where we have seen a major, major revolution, like we saw the revolution of mobile devices, mobile phones. 
so when we were selling bp monitors and glucometers we were actually we had to convince everybody to buy a bp monitor or a glucometer so mm. glucometer sales have been growing quarter to quarter by almost 100% and we had serious challenges of production of glucometers because uh, mm. like you said supply disruptions were there and cargo was not coming up shipments were not arriving in time we were had limitation to increase the manpower there was so much testing norms about covid and then testing the people i mean all the restriction done but still mm. we grew 100% quarter to quarter on the glucometers yeah mr sir you know what i actually wanted to ask you that you know we've seen that actually 2020 uh, brought diagnostics at the uh, hands of the people um at the hands of the patients they have been monitoring themselves and approaching the doctor telemedicine has become a reality and you know products that um, the companies like yours make have become part of day to day lives of people but is it going to be this way what is your assessment do you think this is going to be a long term uh, thing or once we are you know out of this pandemic phase once vaccination goes on people will be back to uh, uh, to, to the normal cycle Uh, what is your assessment? Do you see diagnostics still to be up for the hands of the people? Certainly, at this stage, we feel that okay, this is a temporary thing. But like I said, that maybe to an extent, these things will become permanent because the, once you start checking your glucometer, you start checking your sugar at home, then you know that you can check it. You don't need to go to a doctor. And once mm. you know that you can check BP BP at home, then you don't need to visit a doctor. And second thing, okay. for example, something like. Oximeter. Nobody heard oximeter. This was a small device we were having since last five years. We were not even selling one thousand oximeters in a year. Mm. Now we want ten meters in a month. We can't produce. We don't have a capacity. So that's what is happening. Digital thermometer, of course, I can understand it may be temporary because now every hotel, hospital, shop, clinic, everybody is checking thermometer. That may go away. Mm. But as for as self care devices is concerned, and you use the right word that. now the patient is using in his own hand that's what yeah. our brand is dr parkan says health in your hands uh you know before i get mr sawney into the conversation i'll just very briefly take a comment uh, one more follow up comment from you um you know you spoke about uh, disruptions in manufacturing you spoke about disruptions also in the supply and sales initially um and um, uh, uh, you know disruption in production uh what part of the production of oximeters uh, and all of this is happening in india uh, with the components and raw materials from india how much of localization is there and you know are we self reliant there everyone's been talking about make in india but has this period help us move in that direction um, what is your experience a uh, very briefly yeah so i would say we are on track and like i said we are the only company in the country who is uh, manufacturing uh, all these devices in india we got a manufacturing setup we have 100% production of uh, glucometers bp monitors of course we had to start last year we couldn't start because of labor shortages they said it'll come mm. oximeters we are doing stethoscopes we are doing so these are all falling under the campaign of make in india now the question mm. is make in india is it fully make in india the answer is no we do not have the backup we do not have the components the components are still being imported and there are laws wherein we are restricted in whether we can import this or not import this but as we go forward and as the government is supporting all these initiatives more and more things will be manufactured in india and more and more i would say supply chain would come up and you might have noticed that government is giving incentive of that productioning scheme pli scheme. so pli is there mm. available for the productioning for the api also and this deep diagnostics also even for the electronics also mobile phones also so that is where the backup would come we are at least 2 to 3 year away to become fully reliant but at least we are starting the process mr sawney you know a come on this point you know i uh, i i wanted to take a comment from you exactly on this and that is why i took a follow up question now with mr suri we are talking about resilient supply chains the government is talking about make in india there is a pli schemes um you know in your sense where does the country stand um as far as building this resilient supply chain for manufacturing of pharmaceutical and medical devices uh, is concerned and in your sense what role will automation play in here uh, you know in kind of reducing the risk of disruptions similar to what we've seen in the last year 
So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very, very topical question that uh, you've touched upon, Ajahn. And first of all, I, I completely agree with the point of view that Mr. Suri has, uh, has laid out, right? The short answer is, I, I think we are getting better and the kind of acceleration that, uh, you know, uh, that we've had the opportunity to witness the, the industry go in terms of its maturity to be more reliant, that's been quite awesome. You know, COVID well, and this pandemic, it brings uh, the, the, the broad connotation. Uh, I mean, when was the last time? A year ago, no one would have even thought that in a, in a matter of 10 to 12 months, you know, we're going to be having, uh, you know, so many different viable vaccine candidates, right? You know, it's, you, know you yourself uh, just, just came back from, uh, you know, the, uh, the vaccine, uh, vaccination camps and so forth. It, you know, these things are getting accelerated because technology is bringing about game changing, um, you know, uh, advances and, and uh, you know, maturity, right? Uh, Life sciences pharmaceuticals is, it's always, let's recognize it's been a regulated industry. And, uh, you know, being regulated, it's, it's tough for the industry to move at the pace that other industries are able to move. But, you know, when you bring in these, uh, these, these digital technologies and, and automation, right, you know, um, even a digital, uh, even a regulated industry, you know, can think about, can, can imagine moving at a pace that was up until now, you know, uh, not even practically feasible. And India is pharmacy to the world, right? Uh, you know, and it is very important, not just for the state of the Indian life sciences industry, but it is having, you know, uh, a critical impact on the global life sciences, uh, pharmaceutical, uh, you know, technologies are, are allowing you to imagine things, you know, which are having impact both on the quality side of the operations, as well as on the process uh, side of the operations, you know, yield improvements, uh, reliability improvements, and, 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 and all of that, right? Let's imagine that, you know, you, you've certainly got uh, a set of operators, you know, who are not fully trained, and you have operators, you know, who are trained but available in a different city, right? Now, how do you transfer knowledge from people who have that, you know, in their minds, right? How do you institutionalize that? And how do you actually, you know, make it available so that people who have less, ex less experience in operating those equipments be able to confidently operate those equipments, right? So using augmented reality, uh, using, uh, you know, uh, decision support, using uh, sometimes even things like digital twins, you know, we've been able to actually accelerate the learnings, you know, of operators so that their confidence of operating the assets, you know, uh, goes through a step change. One thing which I can uh, talk about, which probably is the most powerful notion, is, uh, you know, the power of advanced analytics, right? You know, uh, you're suddenly able to have, um, you know, vast amounts of data, you know, which are always available, but, you know, to be able to bring them on a common platform and to apply, you know, uh, deep learning, to apply machine learning, to, to bring out insights which are never really available to you, right? You know, which tell you about, you know, when you're, process is likely to go out of spec, right? You know, it's, it's just giving, uh, it's empowering the, uh, the, the uh, line side operators, plant supervisors in a manner in which they've never been in the past, right? So I would say, uh, you know, my submission to you is, you know, COVID has really meant digital, you know, and uh, this change that the industry has seen, we all, I don't need to, you know, uh, I'll be preaching to the choir, but, you know, uh, this has been um, an irreversible change Absolutely. You know, you touched upon you know, what was supposed to be my next question for you was on, AI, in fact, advanced analytics, AI and uh, blockchain and data that everybody's been talking about. Uh, you kind of briefly touched upon it, but uh, I just want to understand one uh, uh, aspect from you on this. How close are we or how real is the situation when we say that advanced analytics is actually driving uh, you know, supply chains, is it actually driving production or is it still in the nascent stage and needs some more time to actually develop to its full capabilities? Where are we as far as, you know, using um, these uh, AI data uh, and, and these analytics to deal with the disruptions in supply chain and production, et cetera, uh, and make it more serious? Let me instead give you a couple of examples, right? So you'll know how real it is, right? So this is, this is no longer in the realm of... Uh, you know, um, white papers being written or, or some, uh, you know, uh, research work being done, right? We are already, right? You know, we're using uh, AI to detect production anomalies, right? You know, and to give uh, advanced warnings and alerts to, 
uh, operators and workers so they can actually uh, you know investigate you draw their attention to something which requires their attention right why because you know machine learning is working and it it picks up those anomalies as opposed to the operator you know staying glued to a screen you know to watch when the process is going out of spec just a simple example um, you know we are already you know integrating ai into you know process control equipments you know and uh, you know it's in form factors which integrates very very easily into uh, plant control systems right so what it does basically is uh, uh, you know you are you are nesting this capability in existing process control systems so that you can maintain a continuous watch or or a continuous you know monitoring you know uh, identifying uh, you know uh, challenges as they arrive or as they are about to arrive because you know you're talking about uh, predictive uh, capabilities right system is self learning right you know so you don't need to teach these algorithms because you know they they learn by themselves right so that's making it you know a lot more uh, uh, you know easier uh, for uh, for for you know manufacturing engineers to integrate these you know into the uh, just a handful of years ago if you're using ai and ml you know you had to necessarily think of having data scientists on staff right but you know by making sure that you know we are able to take this uh, tech and embed it you know in a form factor that sits in existing process control systems you actually don't need to have data scientists for a vast number of uh, you know commonly used use cases right absolutely not science fiction i just need to understand how deeper has it uh, you know penetrated and you actually uh, brought that up pretty uh, nicely with examples uh, mr suri you know um, you know from the uh, from the new advancement the technological advancements that we are talking about from ai to uh, you know to data to uh, to blockchains um has your company also uh, you know used some of uh, the newer elements of technological advancements and you know what what has been the learnings in the last uh, uh, last one year as far as moving ahead on technology is concerned i think the first learning as i uh, told earlier is that the first learning is that okay we have to be digital and uh, we we don't we should not be hesitant we should step in yeah. and actually yeah. the company stepped in now as a mm. part of the Oh, there were certain things which the company was already working upon, which have been, I would say, fast tracked. For example, okay. EPC planning and control, inventory management, logistics. This is all one package. This was earlier all yeah. being done manually. So now we are trying to get high-end software with AI included and with all the, I would say, like Mr. Sani selling all alerts included. So people have to get used to it. They have to board this bus. There's no choice now. So similarly, mm. when talking of CRM with around 800 customers spread over 80 countries so naturally mm. all the actualities of 80 countries and all the flights and cargoes and disruptions to be included so again we mm. can't do it manually. so this has to be learned by the machine and naturally we, we are integrating that and i think mm. the third important thing which has come now post covid is the man management or i would say the people management to a large extent even the time management the new right. I want issue or a challenge i think even the emotions management so called mental health these are the issues which are the new challenges which have come so work environment and work culture is a big issue now so that is again we are uh, started the process of uh, having intelligent hr software wherein we can integrate the talent we can integrate the development mental health and of course uh, before we started the program we were chatting we are shifting a new office in gurgaon the whole objective is to have a broader culture more openness because we have seen that of course it's nice that people have been working home but certainly they have everybody has developed certain level of i would say not frustration but certain level of i would say boredom so people need more interaction now we are okay to do everything digital but certainly we still need to meet we need to interact how do we have innovative method so on all the three fronts on the customer front production and inventory management front and more so on the people front we are going to use more and more software and more and more intelligent I would say all, all the technical jargon which Mr. Sani is explaining. <laughs> <laughs> all right, <laughs> all right, Mr. Suri, I, I I agree, but for a lot of us, it is jargon uh, when when people talk about analytical science and you know blockchain. At least one aspect I wanted to take a view from both of you. Um, you know, 
how much of digital transformation have we seen on the r and d uh, ecosystem forefront uh, mr sauni if you can briefly highlight that and then i'll go to mr Sauni uh, to understand the need to set up our ecosystem uh, where, where do we stand mr sauni as far as digitalization or the r and d ecosystem is concerned let me answer it in the following manner uh, archana you know so today you have and you're going to blame me for using uh, more jargon here and i'm trying not to uh, but, you know, I would like you to imagine, uh, you know, we talk about digital transformation, you know, think of it as uh, as there being a digital thread that runs all the way from your product design right down to your manufacturing onto your supply chain, right? And there is a, a digital thread that already is running in the context of life sciences pharmaceuticals right from the drug discovery stages, right? So, you know, um, you know, it, it actually allows you to have all of your, you know, let's call it the, the, the PLM side, you know, where you're actually working on the design, uh, you know, and the drug discovery stages, right? And as you take it, you know, to, uh, to your labs and then on to your manufacturing, you have one common thread that runs. That means, you know, it is possible right now for you to have, you know, your, uh, your engineering uh, data, you know, mashed up with your real time, uh, you know, uh, production data and, uh, you know, uh, run scenarios which allow you to couple these two and have uh, implementations which are, you know, kind of like digital twins that allow you to simulate things, right? Uh, I'm seeing the concept of digital thread actually make itself very, very relevant to the life sciences pharmaceutical industries. But I'll be very interested in your point of view, Mr. Suri, as well. Yes, Mr. Suri. Um, how how do you look at how do you look at this R and D ecosystem and digitalization? Ecosystem, I would say two ways. One, of course, is the basic infrastructure. Whether we are talking of Make in India program or I would say in general, so we sadly are, are very much behind uh, the basic infrastructure. So whether it is question of I mean, say the, the complete ecosystem when we talk, but I think on the digital front per se, I think. Uh, the more and more use of data, data or data analytics, because when we finalize any product, any patent or any, I would say, move for the next 10 years, so we have to virtually, I would say, filter through thousands of molecules and thousands of patents and processes and litigation. So everywhere, certainly these things are being earlier done manually. Now there are smart, intelligent software, which are, I would say, getting data through hundreds of different sources and everything is there on the screens. And of course, these are a bit costlier than usual. So our teams are using all the latest equipments and devices. And of course, then finally, like Mr. Sani said, that when we go to the table, then we do not have to do all the experiments on their own. Many of these experiments are unknown in the, on the computer. And I think the big success which everybody is noticing is on the vaccine. Everybody doubts that how can you make a vaccine in six months? How can you get a vaccine in three months? Actually, there are data, there are systems available in the data, and they are just running computer programs. And if this vaccine works for this, how would it work for this? So the only thing they have to do is actual experiment. Rest of the modeling is done by the computers. So we right. are bang on. And as AI is coming, I think this is a big boom for the industry. We've spoken about disruptions. We've spoken about also the way out. Um, there has been certain government programs like the PLI scheme that you highlighted. There have been certain other growth government programs on Make in India or R&D, etc. Uh, but in your sense, currently where we stand right now, whether we look at pharmaceuticals, medical devices, or overall life sciences as a sector, what are some of the pain points that needs to be addressed um, for us to take that leap and become self-reliant, for us to take that leap and become, uh, uh, you know, a more robust supplier of uh, uh, medicines and uh, devices to the world. What, in your sense, are some of the pain points that need to be addressed? I won't call it pain point, but I would say there are certain improvements what we need to take. The biggest one, if I say one word, one word is backward integration and the infrastructure. <laughs> So we have been working on the, I would say, very thin uh, uh, because uh, India is very strong in terms of finished dosages. We are the number one in drug master files. We have the largest number of ANTAs outside US. So of course, uh, other, other than US, India is the largest producer. We are very good at making finished dosages. But unfortunately, we are very weak. I won't say weak. I mean, we are not very strong in making of APIs. Any mm -hmm. more 
API also we need intermediates. We need drug intermediates. We need the key starting raw material, which they say KSM. So that is where India is lacking. That is what we import from China. Even today we have 70, 80 percent import from China, and that's what China does it better. Now, if we want to replicate that, we need huge factories, huge infrastructure. For example, 30 percent of the top 100 products are biotechnology. So we do not have the alpha so biotechnology still in India. We have one or two companies. I mean, we need to set up large facilities. So if we want penciling tea in India, which we were producing earlier by government sector, IDPL, HL were doing the close 20 years ago. If we want to redo, we have to have the facilities of that level. Now, I'm not saying government has to do it. Private sector would do it. But for private sector to do it, private sector needs support. It's only not the financial support. It's only a moral support. Mr. Suri, the ease of doing business that the government talks about, that hasn't replicated as much on ground as much as on paper is what you're saying. That still needs to uh, be ironed out. Um, government on its part somewhere says, um, uh, you know, that it's the industry that doesn't come forward to that extent uh, as much and does not invest as much in R&D particularly uh, as we would require. Uh, how do we balance that in your assessment, sir? So I think ease of doing business is happening. But like I said, there is no synchronization. One department says ease of doing business. Second department comes and they add another 20 guidelines. SEBI comes, they add another 50 guidelines. Then ROC comes, mm -hmm. they introduce another 50 compliances. Then GST comes, they add another 100 compliances. So this is not ease of doing business. So business is becoming more and more complicated, particularly for the larger sector. The compliance sector has become so complicated, so much big paperwork. So there's no more ease. We are making things more and more complicated. The general understanding of the government and all the bureaucrats sitting with, with all the experiences, the general understanding is that industry is not in the favor of the country. You can't, I mean, industry has to galat hai. There is something wrong. I think that's where the attitude is, is an issue. In case the government has favorable, I would say, blessings on the industry, industry can grow very comfortably. I don't think there's an issue. The only issue what we see is a, is a perennial issue is the capital. In India, we do not have capital. We do not have a large capital. Our banks do not give loans for more than 10 years, door to door. It takes three, hmm. four, five years to set up a factory. Mr. Sani, I'll give you the last word on the panel. You know, we spoke about um, a lot of uh, newer elements uh, to talk about. We also spoke about, um, you know, uh, technological advancements. Mr. Suri also highlighted some of the issues that still need to be needs to be ironed out for us to, you know, uh, uh, take that leap forward. But the biggest thing that, uh, you know, is on the minds of every industry which is operating right now is risk mitigation. How do we manage that at a time when, uh, you know, disruptions uh, are so uh, uh, are, are happening? How do we manage risk mitigation? What the kind of decisions companies should take uh, when we are talking about risk mitigation? And um, where does technology come in on that? Um, and, uh, you know, I think that would be a, a, a very good point to also wrap up the conversation and uh, take a forward looking stance on how should companies look at risk management, especially at a time of disruption? I believe that how much the industry is able to exploit the power of digital is directly dependent on how the industry deals with the threats of uh, cybersecurity. You know, we've seen here, right in the Indian context, you know, with leading Indian pharmaceutical companies having cybersecurity incidents, right? And some pretty major ones in the recent months, right? And we are by no stretch of imagination, neither the life sciences industry nor India, you know, as, uh, as a country, you know, uh, there are, you know, millions of such in incidents that are happening. And, you know, we've all read about them, you know, uh, you know, here in India, you know, in, in, in countries like U.S. and so forth. Right. It's just as simple as that. You know, how effectively are you able to implement, you know, the digital transformation programs is directly proportionate to how well are you able to manage the uh, uh, the, the, the risks arising out of cybersecurity threats, right? One sour experience and business leaders would want to go back to the false sense of security of physical isolation. My plant, if it is physically isolated, you know, uh, cut from everything else, you know, uh, should be okay. Uh, it's no longer an option as we've discussed, you know, uh, through the last several minutes. There's an explosion of devices and sensors and connected connectivity across the entire 
uh, enterprise, uh, you know, some of the plants have uh, legacy equipments that do not have a very well thought of, uh, you know, uh, excess strategy, right? In short, there's, uh, there are a very vast array of access points, right? You know, which make it very easy for, uh, uh, for uh, the uh, people who are trying to get, uh, who have uh, malicious intent uh, to, to try and get into your uh, systems and to, to, to disrupt your, uh, uh, your enterprise, right? There is increasingly uh, a, a lot of help that is available. There are, you know, uh, structured approaches, uh, you know, that are uh, being put out. You know, there is uh, uh, some very simple ideas, uh, you know, uh, one that uh, it has been always good hygiene is defense and depth, you know, having, you know, uh, layers that, that give you good protection, right? Uh, and, and variety of other things. Increasingly physical security, uh, what the pandemic has taught us is, you know, uh, you need to have the ability to uh, to monitor, uh, you know, movement of people, right? You know, uh, while we are all becoming very confident now that the news of vaccination is just around the corner and so forth for uh, masses at large. Uh, but, you know, let's just uh, not forget the fact that there are still parts of the country that are seeing, you know, uptick in the number of cases. You know, it is important to, to really implement, you know, uh, uh, the, the basic hygiene, social distancing, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, you can, through the same digital technologies, actually, you know, uh, enforce all of these things inside of factories, inside of, uh, you know, office, uh, you know, facilities and so forth. So, you know, uh, I would just leave it at this, uh, Archana, you know, having a sound, uh, you know, risk assessment around your uh, digital technologies and then an appropriate mitigation plan is, uh, is basic hygiene now and going into future. You summed up the entire panel because the topic of the panel is preparing for a virtual future, and we can only have a virtual, a secure virtual, uh, a strong virtual future if we have it secure. And hence, cybersecurity becomes top priority along with physical security that COVID 19 has taught us. Well, uh, gentlemen, Mr. Suri, Mr. Sami, thank you so much for bringing in your ideas, whether we are talking about AI and blockchains in manufacturing whether we are talking about digitalization of the entire process of manufacturing and sale of products and how companies have been managing it uh, since the pandemic um, and even now and what lies ahead. What are the pain points? What are the issues uh, that the uh, pharma and life sciences industry is still facing that needs to be ironed out? Mr. Suri, Mr. Sauni, thank you so much uh, for sparing time being here on this virtual platform uh, with CNBC TV 18 and Money Control and uh, this program, Make in India, Farmers of the World. Many thanks.